charismatic preaching, those things are all good, but is that the cause of our power outage? Maybe locally, some think our lack of our local leaders, maybe our elders, is the cause of our power outage. You know, some people look to the elders for power. Are these things the real reason for our power outage? Friends, lack of these things are no more the cause of a spiritual power shortage than little Jay Hounds will whack in the telephone pole and thinking he caused the largest blackout ever. These things, although they're good in themselves, cannot. They cannot cover over the deficiency of heaven-born power. Can we have heavenly power? Or are we content with our current situation? The Bible and spirit of prophecy tells us that we can have heavenly power. Power, unlimited, endless, almighty, infinite, awaits our demand and reception. All the resources of omnipotence are ours for the asking. Gospel workers, those who consecrate body, soul, and spirit to God, will constantly receive a new endowment of physical, mental, and spiritual power. The inexhaustible supplies of heaven are at their command. Christ gives them the breath of his own spirit, the life of his own life. The Holy Spirit puts forth his highest energies to work in heart and mind. Through cooperation with Christ, they are made complete in him. And in their human weakness, they are enabled to do the deeds of omnipotence. Do you want power? Amen. Do you feel your need of Christ's promised power? Amen. If you have your Bibles, turn to Luke 10, 19. Luke 10, verse 19. There. Jesus was talking to his 70 disciples. He said, Behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and over all the power of the enemy, and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Did Jesus say, I give you some power? He says, All the power of the enemy. Hmm. Can I? Can I really be a conqueror? Romans 8.37, God's word says, Nay, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him that loved us. Can I really, really have victory and triumph in my life? 1 Corinthians 15.57, But thanks be to God, which gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. 2 Corinthians 2.14, Now thanks be unto God, which always causes us to triumph in Christ. Can I really overcome the world? That mean devil? Is it possible? 1 John 5, 4, For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. Ye are of God, little children, and I've overcome them, because greater is he that is in you that is in the world. Lots of promises from God's word. If I deny God's power, am I denying his gospel? Is this overcoming power tied to the gospel? Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth. Look in the verse. God says, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power. It is not an avenue of power. It is the power. Now, what kind of power? Power to leap tall buildings with a single bound? Power to demand the service of others? Power to command and rule? Satan desired power. Even God's power to be like the most high. But actually, what Satan really desired was to be entirely dislike God. He wanted supremacy, not God's real power, which was God's character. What is gospel power? What is this gospel power? 1 Corinthians 1.18, For the preaching of the cross is to them that perish foolishness, but unto us which are saved, it is the power of God. It's the same words. Get it? Romans 1.16 says the gospel, it is the power of God. 
1 Corinthians 1.18 says the preaching of the cross. It is the power of God. 1 Corinthians 1, 23 and 24, Paul goes on, but we preach Christ crucified, but unto them which are called both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. So the gospel is power. The preaching of the cross is power. This is heavenly power. Paul tells us that it is not, it is not man's power. 1 Corinthians 2, 4 and 5. And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in the demonstration of the spirit and power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. Now the wisdom of men is the knowledge of things of this world. There's a saying that knowledge is power. Well, if you mean knowledge of man alone, that's not true power. If you mean the wisdom of the world, that's not power. That's not heavenly power. Romans 8, 22 says, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Mankind is light years short of God's glory, of God's power. Romans 8, 23 says, for all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 1, 29 says, a fallen man is filled with righteousness, fornication, and wickedness. Mankind without God is nothing but weakness and sin as Paul clearly shows us in Romans 1. Men may even, quote, have morals. They may have, quote, their morals that are good and worthy, but their so-called morality does not make them righteous. Amen. It is like the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Only the gospel, only the gospel in the Bible has divine, living, creative power. Romans 1.16, again, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, Paul says. Paul knew a lot about the wisdom of the world, but he said, I'm not ashamed of this power, for the gospel, for it is the power of God unto salvation, for therein is the righteousness of God revealed. The gospel is power for righteousness. It is stronger than a set of moral teachings. The preaching of Christ crucified is the power of God and the wisdom of God. Right doing is found only in Christ. 1 Corinthians 1.30, But of him are ye in Christ Jesus, who of God is made unto us wisdom and righteousness and sanctification and redemption. So let's look at this power, this gospel power. I need power. I hope you need power. It's the one thing we desperately need. Right now, especially in this time of verse history, and the only real power, the power of God is revealed in the gospel. And in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed, we are told. Now, the righteousness of God is his law. Do you agree with that? And would you agree that his law is love? Yes. Psalms 119, 172, for all thy commandments, our righteousness, right? Right there? And Romans 13, 10, love is the fulfilling of the law. Okay? So I learned back in school that two things that are different equal the same thing, then they're really, those two things are the same thing. So the law equals righteousness, and the law equals love. So the righteousness of God equals the love of God in his law. And it says, in the gospel is revealed the righteousness of God. So in the gospel is revealed the love of God. That's what Ellen White tells us in Mount of Blessing. Righteousness is love. And love is the light and life of God. The righteousness of God is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. No worldly wisdom no worldly might, no amount of fortune can supply true gospel power. And friends, society is crumbling so fast that no money, no wisdom is going to dig us out of this hole. We need true gospel power. The Laodicean church needs the gold tried in the fire. Now, what is the fruit of this heavenly power? Is it big institutions? 
impressive, you know, beautiful church buildings, large membership lists. Let's see what the spirit of prophecy tells us is power. She says, love is power. Love is power. Wow. You know, the hippies, they wanted love power. They wanted flower power, right? They didn't have a good biblical definition. She says, intellectual or moral strength are involved in this principle and cannot be separated from it. The power of wealth has a tendency to corrupt and destroy. The power of force is strong to do hurt, but the excellence and value of pure love consists in its efficiency to do good and to do nothing else than good. That's gospel power. Whatsoever is done out of pure love, be it ever so little or contemptible in the sight of men, is wholly fruitful. For God regards more with how much love one worketh than the amount he doeth. Love is of God. The unconverted heart cannot originate nor produce this plant of heavenly origin, which lives and flourishes only where Christ reigns. That's power. That's the same thing as 1 Corinthians 13, right? The greatest gift is what? Love, charity. It is this power that is part and parcel of the third angel's message. Turn to Revelation 14. What is that angel flying in the midst of heaven? What does it have? Revelation 14, verse 6. The everlasting gospel. It has the gospel. And the gospel is the power of God. And the gospel has the righteousness of God. And the righteousness of God is the love of God. Jesus said to his first disciples in Matthew 28, 18, and 19, and Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore. The gospel brings Christ himself. The gospel transforms unrighteous, wicked people. The gospel does not have in it the powerless ineffective righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees. Jesus himself said of that power in Matthew 5, 20, for I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. That righteousness is superficial. It is on the outside. It is ineffective. It is man-made and it is powerless. It will not transform a sinner and point him to heaven. The true gospel is the power. In it is the true righteousness of God. In it is the law of God, of heavenly origin. And you and I can never originate it. This power lives and flourishes only where Christ reigns. Again, Romans 1.16, For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. The everlasting gospel that is to be preached with a loud voice in these last days is not the gospel that Paul tells us what, that will result in men being lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. 2 Timothy 3, 1 and 2. This know that in the last days perilous times shall come for men shall be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness, but denying the what? Denying the power. That gospel doesn't have the power, so we don't want that gospel. It's powerless. It's a false gospel. It has a form of godliness. It excuses sin. It says you can't get the victory over sin. It's fatal sophistry. Great Controversy says... That Satan works to gain control of the whole mind, and he knows that if these defects are cherished, he will succeed. Therefore, he is constantly seeking to deceive the followers of Christ with his fatal sophistry that it is impossible for them to overcome. We don't want that gospel. That's a false gospel. It doesn't transform the sinner. It does him no good. It makes him a love for pleasure, which is going to be worthless pretty soon because we're not going to have any pleasure pretty soon. Because things are going to fall apart in this world. We need power. We need real power. 
for the preaching of the cross. It is the power of God. God will give us faith and grace to overcome. There is power available to us at Calvary. Lord, if we are so rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing that we don't realize our need of his power. So God sends a COVID. And he says, I'm going to change your attitude. I'm going to give you an attitude adjustment so you can see what you really need. We're substituting externals for heavenly power. Testimonies to ministers. The people of God have accustomed themselves to think that they must rely upon their own efforts. That little help is to be received from heaven. And the result is that they have little light to communicate to other souls who are dying in error and darkness. Are people out there dying in error and darkness? Is Antifa people dying in error and darkness? Is Black Lives Matter people dying in error and darkness? They need the gospel. You know, their little demonstrations, uh, that's nothing. They need power. They need a transformed life. And we need to go tell them. So we need power, right? The church has long been contented with little of the blessings of God. They have not felt the need of reaching up to the exalted privileges and purchase for them at an infinite cost. The power of God awaits their demand and reception. That's a challenge to me. That's a real challenge. Now, the author who wrote the book, was reading on God's power, he contends that the lack of power in the church is due to our unbelief in Christ. Yeah. It's due to our unbelief that Jesus Christ is at the throne of God. He says the Lord's complaint against his people is that they do not trust sufficiently in his power, but their lack of faith are not closely enough linked with him for the free flowing of omnipotence. The belief that Jesus is the Son of God, possessor of the nature and all the attributes and power of deity, is the foundation of the church. Christ answered to Peter's reply. What did he say to Peter's reply that he was the son of the living God? What did, what did Jesus say? That he was the what? That he is the rock. Simon Peter answered and said, Thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus replied, And upon this rock, his broken and abused, bruised body, upon the cross of Calvary, I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. The foundation rock of the church is not man-made power. It is Calvary power. It is Christ. Desire of age is the rock of faith. is the living presence of Christ in the church. Upon this, the weakest may depend, and those who think themselves the strongest will prove to be the weakest unless they make Christ their efficiency. 1 Corinthians 3.11, For other foundation can no man lay than that which is laid, which is Christ. No man can lay that foundation. There's no way. Only Jesus Christ on Calvary can lay the foundation for his church. That rock is himself, his own body for us, broken and bruised, desire of ages. Against the church built upon this foundation, the gates of hell shall not prevail. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, speaking of the risen Christ, says, And hath put all things under his feet, and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. The author asked, But why does the New Testament declare so forcefully that Jesus is none other than the creator of all things. Does creation and the gospel and power, do they all go together? Yes. Ellen White writes, by sin, the image of God and man has been marred and well nigh obliterated. It is the work of the gospel to restore that which has been lost. And so that's the work of the gospel, to restore the image of Christ in man. Yes. And how can we come? into harmony with God? How shall we receive his likeness unless we obtain a knowledge of him? It is this knowledge that Christ came into the world to reveal to us. So it's saying, maybe I don't know Jesus well enough to have his power. Maybe I need an attitude adjustment. 
She says, the meager views which so many have had of, their, of the exalted character and office of Christ, no two things there, the meager views which so many have had of the exalted character and office of Christ have narrowed their religious experience and have greatly hindered their progress in divine life. Personal religion among us is at, as a people is at a low ebb. There is much form, much machinery, much tongue religion, but something deeper and more solid must be brought into our religious experience. We must know the power of his love is revealed in Christ by an experimental knowledge. Yes. Personal religion, personal experience, personal reliance upon Christ. This is the work of the gospel, the true gospel. This is what will restore his image in fallen, wicked, rebellious people. Our lack of power is due to our meager views she says, of Christ's exalted character and his office. So we have meager views of Christ's exalted character and his office. So let's see what is Christ's exalted character and what is his office? Hebrews 8, verse 1, Now of the things which we have spoken, this is the sum. We have such an high priest who is set on the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heavens, a minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle, which the Lord pitched and not man. You and me, we have such a high priest. Not in the White House. Not even at the head of the UN. No, we have a real, living, working high priest at the right hand of the throne of God. And as society disintegrates and our political systems disintegrate and descend into turmoil and chaos, we better know that we have such a high priest. We better know this high priest. We better know that he is able to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. The government's not going to pull us out of this. Nothing's going to pull us out of this except our such a high priest who is at the right hand of the throne of God. Now, what is this high priest's exalted character? It says, seeing then that we have such a high priest that has passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus is God. He is divine. Philippians 2, 6, who being in the form of God thought it not robbery to be equal with God. Hebrews 1, 1 and 3, God, his son, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. This such a high priest who has taken care and purged our sins, who is going to bring this thing all the way through is at the right hand of the throne of God. And we need to know that. We need to act like that. Colossians 1, 16 through 19. Colossians 1, 16 through 19. Turn in your Bibles there. Colossians 1, 16 through 19. Let's look at the power that he wants to give to his church. Colossians 1, 16 through 19. It says there, For by him... All things were created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible, thrones, dominions, principalities, power. All things were created by him and for him. And he is before all things. Wow. Is Jesus big? Is he over everything? Yes. He is before all these things. And by him all things consist. All things hold together by his power. And he is the head of the what? He is the head of the body of the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead. Christ's position is unique. He's the authority. He has absolute power. He's been entrusted with all the authority of heaven. For it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. That's our high priest at the throne of God. Colossians 2, 9 and 10, for him dwelleth all all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. Colossians 2, 9 and 10. For in him, and this is our high priest, for in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. 
and you are complete in him who is the head of all principality and power. You know, I looked up the word Godhead and I had help from the commentary. I didn't get this myself. But the word Godhead here means that Jesus is the essence and nature of God. So he is not just God-like. He is God. He is in the fullest sense God, and you are complete in him. So our completeness is in our high priest at the right hand of the throne of God. And this, this God became a man. He became a man, 1 Timothy 3.16. It tells us there, 1 Timothy 3.16. And without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifest in the flesh. So this God-man is your high priest at the throne of God. This God-man is someone who is interceding for you at the throne of God. Ellen White says, in stooping to take the habiliments of a man, that means the clothing of humanity, Christ did not cease to be God. The human did not become divine, nor the divine human. Christ lived the law of God, showing all men and women that through his grace they can do the same. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. Now, let's look at what Jesus did on earth while he was this God man. Let's see if he claimed to be God. Okay? In Mark chapter 2, you know the story. They let the palsied man down through the roof. His faithful friends did that. And Jesus said to the palsied man who had been let down, he said to him in verse 5, Son, thy sins be forgiven thee. And the Jews immediately, they said in their minds, who can forgive sins but God alone? And you know what? They were right. They were right. Because this was God alone. The humble Christ was God right before their blind eyes. The problem is he was so humble that they thought he couldn't be God. There's no way this humble Galilean can be God. But it required divine creative power to forgive and cleanse that man. Desire of Ages, 269. It required nothing less than creative power to restore health to that decaying body. The same voice, the same voice that spoke life to man created from the dust of the earth had spoken life to the dying paralytic. And the same power that gave life to the body had renewed the heart. He who at creation spake and it was, who commanded and it stood fast, had spoken life to the soul dead in trespasses and sins. That's our great high priest. That's our great high priest. That's what he wants to do with you and me. Now, Jesus, when he was on earth, you know, he didn't refuse when people worshipped him. He didn't refuse that. Even the angel Gabriel, when John the Revelator uh, fell down at his feet to worship him, said, no, you can't do that. Even Jesus himself, when Satan tempted him to worship him, Jesus said, get thee behind me, Satan, for it is written, thou shalt worship the Lord thy God, and him only shalt thou serve. But when Christ was on earth, he accepted worship. No problem. He didn't refuse worship because he was divine. When the, he healed the blind man and he told him, go wash in the pool of Siloam and he came back seeing and he fell down and he worshiped at Jesus' feet. Did Jesus say, no, no, you can't do that? No, he accepted that worship, right? He, he, he said, I am God. He clearly told him that. When Simon Peter saw the catch of fish, he fell down at Jesus' knees and said, depart from me for I am a sinful man, O Lord. Jesus accepted that worship because he knew he was God. He knew it was truth. Jesus, in his earthly ministry, claimed to be equal in power with God. Jesus did the same work in John 5, 17. My father works hitherto, and I work. He said all men should honor the Son, even as they honored the Father. He claimed to be the I Am, and the Jews, they understood that claim because they took up stones to kill him. 
Jesus in John chapter 10, turn to John chapter 10. Jesus there said to the Jews, he told them there, he said, I am the light of the world. I am the light of the world. And he says, I and my father are one. And here again, the blind Jews, they were just, you know, they couldn't, comprehend this humble Galilean. How can he be God? Give me a break. And they took up stones to stone him again. But you know what? Christ didn't run away behind the wall. He didn't go high. He didn't, he didn't you know, change anything. He just came more in their face. And he said in verses 36, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. If I do not the works of my Father, believe me not. But, he says in verse 38, the Father is in me, and I in him. Jesus didn't apologize for this supposed assumption on his part. He didn't say to his accusers, well, no, 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 wait a minute, put down your stones. You misunderstand me. You know, you got it wrong. Oh, no, no, he didn't. He said, I'm God. You're right. You got it right. I'm God. But they couldn't accept it. They couldn't accept it. He was too humble. But he exemplified a more perfect character than anyone that has walked this earth. Jesus is the humble servant of mankind. And Jesus is the almighty God, Revelations 1.8. He is the almighty. Everything in the Bible says that Jesus is God. Every promise that we are to claim depends upon his exercise of omnipotent power. And one day, the opening heavens are going to reveal him as he really is, as King of kings and Lord of lords. Christ is divine. Christ is human, holy divine. He has divine, omnipotent power, and that's what he wants us to have. And I really think we don't believe it. I know I don't believe it. In the book of Hebrews, Paul tells us that the Old Testament priestly ministry was the great teaching lesson, right? of the reality of Christ's high priestly ministry, of our risen and triumphant Savior. Turn back to Hebrews 1, verse 3. Hebrews 1, verse 3. It says there, Hebrews 1, verse 3, of Christ, that he is not only creator, but that Jesus is the sustainer of everything in this world. Hebrews 1, verse 3. Who being the brightness of his glory, and the express image of his person, and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Christ upholds everything by his word, his powerful word, the same creative word that he spoke the world into existence. He upholds everything, it says, by the word of his power. The word uphold here is pharaoh to carry, to bring. You know, the idea is not like Jesus being Atlas, you know, holding up the world and groaning underneath his weight. No, not even in the sense of Jesus being the ruler of this world. No, the word means holding something to bring it somewhere. Holding something close to bring it to a definite goal. Like in Ephesians 1.10, that he might gather together in one all things in Christ, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing. That's his power. That's his upholding power. He wants to bring us somewhere. He has a definite purpose in your life. He has an express intent. And obviously no one, no man, but the creator and sustainer can bring this about. Amen. The high priest superintending his church in heaven, he knows every detail of our individual lives and of our church life. Amen. In Revelation 2 and 3, how does Jesus introduce each church? I know thy, Jesus knows what's going on. Hebrews 4.13 says, All things are naked and open unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. No man can do that. No man can do the work of sustaining and saving his people. Divine, infinite wisdom and power is what we need. 
to reach his definite goal for us. He will employ this power freely in our lives. Romans 8, 29, for whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his son, that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. And I love this little quote Ellen White says on that verse, Christ is sitting for his portrait in every disciple. You know, we need to keep that, like, maybe paste it on our forehead, you know what I mean? <laughs> At least I do. Christ became one flesh for us. Divinity understands our condition. He uses his knowledge and power to aid us in reaching his goal for us. For in that he himself has suffered being tempted, he is able to succor them that are tempted. He as a man knows how dependent human beings are upon divine power. As God, he has almighty power which he uses to aid us, to succor us, to bring us to his desired goal. He is always on duty. Christ is always the first responder. His power is always available. His divinity is always available for us. Desire of Ages 123 says, and he came to make us partakers of the divine nature. So long as we are united to him by faith, sin has no more dominion over us. God reaches for the hand of faith in us to direct it, to lay fast hold upon the divinity of Christ that we may obtain to perfection of character. The divinity of Christ is the believer's assurance of eternal life. Righteousness by faith has for its foundation the belief in the divinity of Christ. Righteousness is obtained by faith. It is both imputed and it is imparted. Ellen White says, steps to Christ, we have no ground for self-exaltation. Our only ground of hope is in the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and in that wrought out by his spirit working in and through us. It's a gift. It's all, we have no ground for self-exaltation all the way through. It's Christ's power all the way through. Amen. Christ's object lessons. The religion of Christ means more than the forgiveness of sin. It means taking away our sins. It means filling the vacuum with the graces of the Holy Spirit. That can come only from God. It cannot come from any other source. You know, maybe this is why the Antichrist papal system that tries to mimic Christ's high priestly ministry, maybe this is why it's called the man of sin. All he can offer is a power that can overcome sin. The best the man of sin offers is a life of continual failure and sin. That's all he offers. Believe me. If you were Catholic, you would know. You go to confession, you sin. You go another week, you go to confession, you sin. That's the best he has to offer for you. Now, we have just read in Hebrews 1, 3 that he is upholding all things by the word of his power. That this Jesus is exercising that power to carry the load of the universe to an intended and definite purpose. Desire of Ages says, he whose word of power, speaking of Christ as a young boy, he whose word of power upheld the world would stoop to relieve a wounded bird. So the creator and sustainer of the universe would stoop to help a wounded bird. Do you think he would stoop to help you? Amen. Do you think he would stoop to help us? The worlds obey that power of God as they are sustained in their orbits. Jesus upholds everything by his word. He maintains the orderly arrangement of the universe. Education, the Apostle Paul, writing by the Holy Spirit, declares of Christ that all things have been created through him and unto him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. She says, the hand that sustains the worlds in space, the hand that holds in their orderly arrangement and tireless activity all things throughout the universe is the hand that was nailed to the cross for us. Amen. I can't understand that, but man, I, I just want to know that. I want to understand that. Christ suffered the shutting out of his father's face on Calvary. The second death, Christ suffered that to bring you back within his heavenly orbit that you might again be restored to his intended purpose for you. 
Christ on Calvary took upon himself all the sins, all the disorder, all the rebellion, that he might bring you and me back with heavenly, heaven's orderly arrangement, that God's law might be restored in your mind. Jesus triumphed on Calvary. He, by faith, won the victory on Calvary when he hung his head and died. And Christ wants to use that same infinite knowledge, that same tender sympathy, that same triumphant power to uphold all of us who put our complete trust in him. He says that in Jude 24 and 25, now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his throne, of his glory with exceeding joy. To the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty and dominion and power. He's able to do it. Do you want to let him do it? Colossians 1, 16 and 19. I won't read the whole thing, but it says, we just read it, that Christ is before all things. He upholds all things. He is the head of the church. And then it says in verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. Christ's work as the head of his body, the church is connected with Christ as the creator of all things. He not only creates, but he holds everything together. And Christ holds the church together. It's his body. You know, Christ's headship of the church is different from like a ruler or a head of state. Christ is the head of the church. He is not like a head of government who executes laws, but he is the head of life-sustaining influence. From the head flows all heavenly power and all influence. You know, you can live without an arm. You can live without a finger, but you can't live very long without a head. And Christ is the head. And sometimes I think as a church, we try to live without the head. We try to be the head. It says in verse 19, for it pleased the Father that in him should all fullness dwell. All fullness dwells in Christ. And it pleases the Father that it does. The fullness of abundance is not only for himself. This fullness that Christ has is not just for himself. He doesn't just keep it for himself. He, is, he doesn't want his church to be like a little child standing outside a store window just admiring all the beautiful things. No, his fullness he desires his body to have. As the head is the seat and source of the body, interconnected and directing its actions, Christ is the source of the fullness of grace to his church. We have a heavenly written invitation to come to the throne of grace to obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need, Hebrews 4.16. John and John 1 gives the same idea that all things were made by Christ. And then it says, but as many as received him to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Christ is creator. Christ is sustainer. And it says in John 1.16, and of his fullness have we all received. Ephesians 1, 22 and 23, and it put all things under his feet to give him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him that filleth all in all. We are to know the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe. We are know, to know the love of Christ which passes knowledge, that ye may be filled with all the fullness of God. That's God's intent for us. All through scripture, we are given this. Hebrews 1, Colossians 1, John 1, Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. Turn there in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2. God, over and over, gives us his intention to, to beautify and to restore his image in our hearts. He says, but now, in Isaiah 43, 1 and 2, he says, but now, thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed the O Israel and Jacob and Israel are synonymous with God's church. Fear not, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers they shall not overflow thee. When thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee. 
What's that remind you of? Yes, the three Hebrews, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Do you think they claim this promise when Nebuchadnezzar threw them in the fiery furnace? Do you think the same Christ who walked with these men who refused to break God's commandments will walk with those who refuse to break his fourth commandment in the face of the last day Sunday law, in the face of the mark of the beast? Do you think he'll fulfill that same promise? Yes, he will. Ellen White writes, the commandments of finite sinful men are to sink into insignificant beside the word of the eternal God. We need to know who Jesus is. We need to know that he is the only one to be obeyed. We need to know that truth is to be obeyed at any cost, even though, catch this, even though, this is a little scary, but catch it, even though gaping prisons, chain gangs, and banishment stare us in the face. Jesus is in control, friends. Amen. If you are loyal and true, that God who walked with the three Hebrew children in the fiery furnace, who protected Daniel in the lion's den, who manifested himself to John on the lonely island, will go with you wherever you go. His abiding presence will comfort and sustain you. Amen. Over and over she says that. He who walked with the Hebrew worthies in the fiery furnace will be with his followers wherever they are. Repeatedly throughout scripture, Jesus says, I am the first and the last. I am the first. I am the creator. I am the sustainer. And I am the last. I am your redeemer. I am going to bring you to your heavenly destination. That is God's purpose for you. No matter what the situation is. Isaiah 44, 6, thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, his redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first, I am the last, and beside me there is no God. Jesus wants to bring you all the way home, friend. Jesus is the first and the last. He says this over and over. In Revelation 1, 8, he starts that great history of the church, the great history and prophecy of his church. He starts with, I am Alpha and Omega. I'm the beginning and the ending. I'm him which was, is, and was, and is to come, the Almighty. I'm going to just bring this thing all the way through. And he bookends the last chapter of Revelation with the same words in Revelation 22, 13. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the first and the last. Christ tells us in the beginning he's going to do it, and at the end he has done it. He has his intended purpose realized in his church. Ellen White says, in closing, in Acts of the Apostles, through centuries of persecution, conflict, and darkness, God has sustained his church. Do we know that now? This side of history? We know that, right? Not one cloud has fallen upon it that he has not prepared for. Not one opposing force has risen to counterwork his work that he has not foreseen. All has taken place as he predicted. He has not left his church forsaken, but has traced in prophetic declarations what would occur, and that which his spirit inspired the prophets to foretell has been brought about. All his purposes will be fulfilled. His law is linked with his throne, and no power of evil can destroy it. Truth is inspired and guarded by God, and it will triumph over all opposition. Friends, I want to be on the winning side. How about you? I want to be on the side that triumphs over all opposition. She says the world is not without a ruler. The program of coming events is in the hands of the Lord. Praise God. God's got it, man. COVID, he's got it. Antifa, he's got it. Anything else that comes our way, God's got it. The majesty of heaven has the destiny of nations as well as the concerns of his church in his own charge. She says, in the last great closing work, we shall meet with perplexities that we do not know how to deal with. Like COVID, right? But let us not forget, the three great powers of heaven are working. A divine hand is on the wheel, friends. This truth is going through. Gabriel the angel saw it go through. He gave it to Daniel at the beginning. This thing is going all the way to the close. Amen. She says, God will bring his purposes to pass. Amen. We need his power, don't we? Amen. We need to know Amen. that we have the real ruler, the only one that we need to obey, 
is right up in heaven. I mean, we obey men. We don't, you know, go and be rash or anything like that. But when it interferes with God, your ruler's in heaven. Okay? I guess that's it. <laughs> I don't think we have a closing song. Oh, okay, yeah. Beloved Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that all power has been given to you. You are all power. And Heavenly Father, when you claim us as your own, we claim you as our God. Dear Lord, we have access to everything, anything imaginable and beyond imagination that we need. Thank you for that peace. Heavenly Father, as we see things unfold around us, Lord, uh, Jesus granted us a very special promise. Is my peace I give unto you. Not as the world giveth, give I unto you. Let not your heart be troubled, and neither let it be afraid. And so, Heavenly Father, bless the word down upon our hearts. Fill us, Lord, with your Holy Spirit as we leave this place, so we may indeed live for you and shine as lights in a dark world. Heavenly Father, may our presence wherever we go be a, a balm and an incense of grace and strength to those that come in contact with us because they have come in contact with you. Bless them. Bless us. May we go from this house, Lord, enabled. May we go from this house filled. May if you go with it from this house at peace. May we go from this house assured of the power of heaven within us because Jesus dwells in our heart to that end we pray to you we give ourselves afresh in Jesus name amen may God bless and give you a wonderful Sabbath our exit will be this direction thank you